Hi, Professor Strang. Thank you so much for for uh, doing this. Why don't you tell the audience a little about yourself? Sure. Well, well thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, so this series is dedicated towards helping uh, law students like yourself, uh, lawyers, average Americans to to have a have a taste of the debate, the robust debate that's been going on for fifty years now over originalism, including in particular for this series the criticisms of originalism and then the responses that originalists have, have offered to those criticisms. And, um, and one of the things that I love about this topic that we're doing tonight, so our criticism tonight is, or our challenge to originalism is that originalism is a, a facade for conservative policy goals. And I was reading some of the materials and, and I came across, and some of your reader, some of our audience may have come across, I guess you can't see it, uh, a, a New York Times op-ed that came out yesterday titled, The Crisis in Teaching Constitutional Law. And the op-ed, is about uh, the current Supreme Court under, quote, the pretense of practicing so-called originalism and uh, and the challenges that faculty who teach constitutional law like myself are having. And I'm a little bit, I don't know, embarrassed to say that one of the faculty members said, quote, while I was working on my syllabus for this course, I literally burst into tears because of the so-called originalism. And so so this is this is a very apropos time to talk about uh, the, 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 the argument that originalism is facade for uh, uh, conservative policy preferences. Can you please elaborate more on the critique that originalism is a facade made up by conservatives for, for conservative policy and what scholars have articulated those criticisms? Yeah, yeah, so so let's talk about what, what, the, what the criticism is. Let me just first note that there's something a little bit odd about the criticism. So unlike most of the criticisms that we talk about over this 10 episode series, which are directed at yeah, originalism's response to precedent or originalism's ability to ascertain the original meaning. So I take them to be substantive critiques of originalism. Hey, you can't do what you say you're trying to do. This response is a little bit different. It's, it's focused on the people and the motivations of the people who do originalism. And in particular, it's saying because of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the motivations that originalists have or because of the uh, uh, outcomes of originalist interpretation, Originalism is X, and X is inconsistent with what an audience member might like or might not like. So there's kind of an ad hominem aspect to it. So I just want to raise that and put it aside because it is a criticism that's that's often out there. In fact, in that op-ed, that's that's actually a premise of of the criticism. So I think the criticism at its core is that originalism is just a smokescreen. That that what it really is, what originalism really is, in in its premises, in its arguments, in its practice, is a way for judges, scholars, I guess average Americans, political parties to have the Supreme Court articulate under the guise of a, a, a neutral theory of interpretation, uh, actually something that's a, a conservative uh, uh, policy agenda. And I think the two best scholars most recently who have made this argument, uh, one is uh, Professor Eric Siegel uh, in his book, Originalism as Faith. And, uh, and it's a great book. It's got a lot of criticisms and, and the criticism I'm gonna articulate right now are based on his book. And second, uh, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky has a, a new book, maybe a year old now, called uh, Worse Than Nothing. So originalism is worse than is literally worse than nothing. And so I think the criticism has, has four basic components. So the first component is that the outcomes of originalism just, boy, they magically seem to always be conservative. And um, Professor Siegel in his book gives a list of cases, and, 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 and his, he is a blogger, and so on his blogs he articulates other uh, cases as well. So cases he identifies include cases dealing with affirmative action, uh, dealing with campaign finance reform, dealing with the 11th Amendment, dealing with the 10th Amendment. So you get the idea. There's a lot of areas in Professor Siegel's view 
where the thing that's doing the work that's explaining the outcomes isn't originalism. It's the, uh, the purported conservative policy preferences of the judge or justices. Second, there's an argument that's related, which is that uh, that, that the critic will say something like, we know the original meaning of, the, of a provision is X. We know the justice has reached a conclusion not X, and therefore that's evidence that originalism isn't what's doing the work, something else is doing the work. An example that Dean Chemerinsky gives in his book is the 11th Amendment. So the 11th Amendment uh, was famously uh, passed in response to Chisholm versus Georgia. And if you've taken constitutional law, you might have read Chisholm versus Georgia. And Chisholm versus Georgia allowed uh, uh, the federal courts to entertain suits against non-consenting states. Shortly thereafter, the 11th Amendment was adopted. And there's a debate, does the 11th Amendment merely overturn Chisholm versus Georgia, or does it stand for a broader structural principle about the immunity of non-consenting states from suit in federal court? And what, just, what Dean Chemerinsky argues is that the historical record shows that that narrow interpretation is the right interpretation. But then if that's true, that's inconsistent with the opinions by the Supreme Court justices, including Justice Scalia, in the more modern 11th Amendment doctrine that takes a broader interpretation of the 11th Amendment. A third criticism along this line is to point to cases where uh, self-described originalist justices reach a conclusion, but they do so without using originalism. And I actually have a lot of sympathy for this criticism. I, I'll talk about my sympathy for other criticisms in a moment. But the one that uh, is most commonly brought up and one that I personally agree with was in the affirmative action context. So beginning with J.A. Crozen versus Richmond, uh, Justice Scalia and, Ju and then later Justice Thomas signed on to opinions that came to the conclusion that the 14th Amendment uh, identified strict scrutiny for the analysis for race-based affirmative action. And the justices, Scalia, Thomas, didn't give any originalist reasons uh, for, for adopting that. They gave kind of conventional law, legal reasons, precedent tells us this or something, or something else tells us this, but not originalist reasons, at least not until the recent Justice Thomas opinion in Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard. And then the last argument that critics have used to identify originalism as being a facade for conservatism is really a genealogy. So there's a standard conventional history of originalism, which looks back to originalism coming on uh, to its modern terms in the early 1970s. And it was at that point clearly and expressly a criticism of the more liberal or progressive Warren and Berger courts. And so then what, what scholars like uh, Siegel and Chemerinsky will do is they'll say, this was its genealogy and it retained that original outlook, that original anti-progressive outlook and pro-conservative outlook up to, up to today. So it started as a rebuttal and continues to be a, a, a pro-conservative uh, position. So I think those are the, the four main ways in which critics have argued that originalism is a facade for conservative policy outcomes. Um, we've had a question from the audience addressing another one of these criticisms. Um, what about the claim that judges only apply originalism when it would lead to conservative conclusions, but ignore originalism when it does not? Yes, and I appreciate that that question. I think what what I was my my third criticism, I think, is meant to be that, right? So the third criticism is where you have in the affirmative action context, something that appears to be a conservative outcome as to identified by current policy preferences, but the but the judges don't use, uh, originalism to justify that, and so you have um, uh, you have uh, something that something that reaches conservative originalism, conservative results without originalism. And the question is saying the judges only apply originalism when it leads to conservative conclusions, but ignore it when it doesn't. And and maybe the implication is that the reason why Justices Scalia and Thomas didn't use originalism in the early affirmative action cases is because they thought that the original meaning of the Fourteenth Amendment actually did not prohibit. Uh, race-based affirmative action. And, and just to be clear, there's a, there's a, there is a robust debate going on uh, in that area. One article uh, that's, that might be worth reading for people is Jed Rubenfeld's article, I think titled Affirmative Action. And what he does is he details evidence that from his perspective supports a, a, uh, a position that allows for race-based affirmative action. And so maybe the, the argument would be that Justice Scalia and Thomas and others were, were worried, gosh, maybe Rubenfeld's right, so we actually can't delve into the original meaning. So, so I, I take that to be a, a real criticism, the one that, that Mr. Watkins identified. Um, how do originalists respond to these criticisms? Yeah, yeah I, I'll have like two moves for, for that, Sophia. So one move would be to say, I agree with it. So there are lots of situations when I'm teaching constitutional law, what I try to do is have a charitable interpretation of the, uh, the case be before us, before us in the class. And that charitable interpretation means taking it at its, at its best lights, 
but then we also criticize it, whatever the opinion is, whoever wrote it, whatever methodology is. And one of the standard moves that I try to make is that when a judge or justice who, who self-articulates as, hey, I'm an originalist judge or justice and doesn't use originalism to reach a result or maybe does it in a really thin way, I raise that. So I think, for example, Employment Division versus Smith, which is the 1990 opinion where uh, in the opinion written by Justice Scalia, uh, interpreted the free exercise clause, provide relatively modest support for religious exercise. And Justice Scalia, I think he's got one sentence in there, that's it, where he talks about uh, something to the effect of uh, the text of the free exercise clause, and we don't think it needs to be read in a way that supports exemptions. So it's it's just the, a very thin, arguably non-originalist interpretation of the clause. I think the 11th Amendment might be another area. So the 11th Amendment deals with sovereign immunity. And uh, the court's cases culminating, in my view, in Alden versus Maine, uh, which dealt with the ability of non-consenting states to be sued in state court. The opinion was written by Justice Kennedy. I think Justice Scalia joined the opinion. It's, it, it has some structural arguments in it. So it's not, it doesn't have nothing, but it doesn't have a whole lot. Um, I also think that the affirmative action criticism is a real criticism as well. Uh, for a long time, the justices, Scalia and Thomas, didn't give any originalist reasons for their position. Justice Thomas did recently in his in his concurrence in Students for Fair Admission. And uh, and I think the uh, the kind of center of gravity for original scholarship supports Justice Thomas's conclusion there. But my point is that there's a lot, a lot to criticize. But that, that relates to my kind of next point on this, which is that I wonder if critics have too high of a standard to judge originalism. And so what I mean by that is, Originalism is a human practice. Us humans, we tend to uh, sometimes do things that are just good faith mistakes. Sometimes we do things that are unconscious motivated reasoning. In other words, we've got a really impassioned policy goal and we kind of manipulate, not knowingly, the material to achieve that policy goal. And then we humans have even been known, Sophia, I know this may shock you, to sometimes intentionally do things wrong. And so, so if, if that's true about humans in general, it's probably true of originalists as well, the judges, the scholars who do that. And so I, I guess I think that those those criticisms are kind of, yeah, I get that, that, and those are true criticisms, and I think we should criticize the judge or justice or scholar who misapplies or misarticulates the original meaning, but that doesn't necessarily undermine originalism. So now let me just turn to the responses it, itself. So I think the first thing that I would say, Sophia, is that when you look at who the originalist scholars and judges are, they come from all the different backgrounds. And so just, I have I have a list in my mind of kind of the leading originalist scholars. And those scholars come from the left of the spectrum. They come from the center of the spectrum. They come from the right of the spectrum. And then there are other people who are kind of hard to classify under current viewpoints. And so it's really hard to say that what's doing the work in originalism is something conservative when a lot of the people who are originalists and really thoughtful originalists aren't conservative. So the critic would have to have some kind of other explanation, like maybe a false consciousness, but I think really the simpler explanation is that originalism has good reasons to commend it that people of all different viewpoints can accept as being good reasons. And that goes to my second point then, Sophia, which is when you look at the reasons for originalism, like the normative justifications for it, some of them are based on natural rights, some of them are based on democracy, those reasons are widely accepted by all Americans. So Americans left, right, and center like democracy. And so if you're persuaded by the justification given by Keith Whittington in his scholarship, that originalism properly followed leads to the most protection for democratic processes, then if that's your view, if that's your, your normative justification, regardless of your viewpoint, you're going to think that originalism is, is for you. And then the third kind of response on, on that would be when you look at the reasons supporting originalism, whether or not the critic is right. So in other words, even if critics are right, that originalism came out of a right of center movement, and even if critics are right, which again, I'm not saying is true, that originalists today are doing originalism because of conservative policy reasons, that still actually is, I think, orthogonal to the question at the table, which is, does originalism have sound reasons to commend it? And so if originalism does have sound reasons to commend it, then why, whatever reason people are proposing it is not relevant to whether you or me should follow those sound reasons. And then the last move I would make, Sophia, would be to turn the criticism around. So. So the criticism is originalism is a facade for conservatism. And so what if a critic of a living constitutionalism was to say, living constitutionalism is just a facade for liberal or progressive results. And I've never made that argument because I actually don't know what follows from it. Like, so okay, so if that's true, it could still be the case that living constitutionalism is the right way to interpret our constitution. And so 
And so I, th I think the point of turning it around just shows that I don't think it works in the other direction, and, and it also doesn't work in the direction pointed towards the originalism. Do you want to do one of the questions in the chat? Yes, we're receiving a couple of questions actually from Emory students. Okay, great. Uh, the first one is from Alex Chang for EEOC versus Smith. The current justices have recognized that Smith is a departure from originalism principles, yet they refuse to overturn that precedent, even though it has severely burdened religious freedom. Why is that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's an area that I'm personally interested in. I've been writing about religion and religious, religious uh, liberty law for a long time. So what Mr. Chang is talking about is uh, Employment Division versus Smith, I had mentioned earlier, Justice Scalia had this very thinly reasoned argument that the Free Exercise Clause provides modest protection for religious liberty. And Mr. Chang identifies that it seems like most of the justices in the court currently think that that's not a correct interpretation. I think that's right. I think most of the justices think that the original meaning of the Free Exercise Clause provides more protection than Employment Division versus Smith. And for Mr. Chang and for others, the, the article that I think is probably the, still the seminal article in that area is an article in 1990 by Michael McConnell. It's titled, I think, uh, The Original Understanding of Religious Liberty or something like that. And uh, and so I think that has been very influential uh, down through the years. So so why not overturn it? I actually think that that's, that's a great question. It, it's kind of just a broader question, right? And so if you were to think of much of American law currently as being eclectic, and what I mean by that is it's got some original stuff and it's got some non-original stuff. Some of it has a lot of non-original stuff. Some of it has just a little bit but it's mixed is my point, then, then, then I think it becomes a question of stare decisis, which Mr. Chang points to, as to whether the court overrules, narrows, or follows that prior precedent. And the, 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 the originalist scholars and judges have differing views on that. So for example, Justice Thomas famously has the view that he articulated maybe five years ago that, that if there's a precedent that is clearly wrong, clearly an incorrect non-originalist precedent, which he might think Smith is one of those, then, then the court should overrule it, period, with, with no questions asked. But other originalist justices and originalist scholars have identified other analyses, and the other analyses are a little bit more complicated, so it's hard to kind of say in detail what that would be here. But if you're following this other analysis, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to overrule a precedent right away. It may mean You'll narrow it. And so actually, that's what I think is going on right now. Since since um, 2015, uh, it was the Missouri uh, Lutheran Church case uh, where the Supreme Court um, basically did not follow Smith, didn't give much of a reason for not following Smith. And then you see the line of cases. In every case since then, the Supreme Court has identified another exception or a, a capacious interpretation of the exceptions to the Smith rule. And so I think what's going on is the current majority of justices are using not the Justice Thomas approach, but a more standard approach to stare decisis, and they're kind of whittling away and making exceptions to it. Now, maybe at some point the exceptions swallow the rule, and maybe we're there already, but I, I do think reasonable people disagree about whether either of those situations has occurred. So that's a long way of saying to Mr. Chang that I think the current justices are following stare decisis, and we may be getting close to a tipping point uh, in that area. Do you want to do the next one, or do you want to ask a question, Sophia? It's up to you. Um, I would like you to just, I'll, we'll go back to the questions. I would like you to explain Justice Black's politics and relationship to religionalism and the originalist movement. Okay. So, so that's, that. I think of that as, as a great question. It's kind of a curveball, because most people, when they talk about originalism today, don't talk about Justice Black. So Justice Hugo Black, for those who don't remember, was one of the justices appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Justice Black is known as maybe the first or, the, or a proto-originalist justice on the Supreme Court. And so, so when you think about Justice Black, there are two things that I think are relevant to our conversation tonight. So one was, nobody doubts the guy loved the New Deal. He was, he was a progressive New Deal senator uh, from the South. He was uh, an ally of President Franklin Roosevelt. It's because of his uh, alliance, both political and ideological, that President Roosevelt appointed uh, Blackman, I'm sorry, Black, to the to the Supreme Court. And if you want to read more about Black, I think uh, an interesting book, a very readable book, is uh, Scorpions by Noah Feldman. So on the one hand, Justice Black, everybody agrees, very progressive, very liberal by the standards of the time, and maybe today, I don't know. But then second, Justice Black, as your question suggests, was also somebody who had, as a part of his official philosophy of interpretation, focusing on the text and original meaning of the Constitution. Now, maybe not in the exact same way that we do today, 
So for example, when you read, when you read Justice Black's opinions, it seems like he has kind of two steps in his move. So one, one step is to say, does the, does the plain text, that's his phrase, or does the clear text answer this question? And if the answer is yes, then we follow it. And so we're not looking to policy, we're not looking to other kind of prudential considerations like his colleagues, Justice Frankfurter and others would have pointed to. So, so that's, that's a, a sort of originalist move, that the, the meaning is fixed and you follow it, period. And second, he would say that if the meaning wasn't clear, then you look to history and tradition to identify the meaning. And you see that in a lot of Justice Black's opinions. Uh, for those who have been who have taken maybe Article Two in your constitutional law structure course, you might have done the Youngstown Sheet and Tube case. Um, and in that case, Justice Black wrote the majority opinion, although there were a lot of concurring opinions as well. And what does Justice Black do? He spends time looking at the history of Article Two and the history of the activity of the presidency and Congress in that area. So that, that would be an example of what he's saying. I also think Everson versus Board of Education is another example. That's the, the first modern establishment clause case. And Justice Black, the entire opinion is history. And uh, I'm skeptical of the history for what it's worth, but it's clearly an example of his following history to where he perceived it as leading him. And so Justice Black would be an example of somebody who had uh, clearly progressive politics, but somebody who was also at the same time what we would characterize today as an originalist. So, so that's a great question. And it kind of uh, gives us an opportunity to talk about something we normally don't talk about. Awesome. I'm glad to ask it. Um, we have more questions from the audience. I'm not sure if you would like to um, turn to that. We have a question. Can you make a strong originalist argument in favor of a state like Texas being able to enforce the border laws when the federal government has been refusing to enforce the laws Congress has passed? Yeah. So, so I think that's a great question. It, it's one that's outside of my area. Now, I want to use this as an example to talk about originalism. And so when it comes to identifying originalism, uh, it's it's work, right? It's not it's not what I think is the more is the morally best outcome. It's not what I think is the right policy outcome in this case. What it is is I've got the text of the different provisions. So it could be Congress's Commerce Clause. It could be Cong Congress's Immigration and Naturalization Power. Uh, it could be uh, reservations of power to states to be able to repel invasions. Right? There's lots of questions like that. Lots of texts that are involved in the question that was just asked. And a person would have to spend the time to look at the original meaning of those different areas. And, and it's something I just haven't done uh, in, in that area. So I, I don't have a direct answer, but, but the way I would go about it would be looking at the text, structure, history, and precedent of the different relevant clauses to answer that. And there's a way in which I think that's actually a complement to originalism. So I can't give an off-the-cuff answer. I don't got an answer because I haven't looked into it. But if you compare that to one of the major alternatives, living constitutionalism, so Living constitutionalists look at text, structure, history, and precedent. So a lot of overlap there with originalism. But one thing that they also add would be some other variable, some other data set from which they draw. It could be social movements. It could be the acts of the other branches. It could be the justice or judge's own policy preferences. And especially if it's that latter, which I think often was the case throughout the 20th century for non-originalist justices, then it's actually really easy to give an answer, which is, what do I think the result should be? And then I tell you that result. And, uh, and so I'm not able to do that because that's not the approach that I'm advocating here. Yeah, um, we have another question. It seems like there are many self-described originalists who actively avoid any meaning to the Ninth mm -hmm. Amendment in a way unlike how they treat any other constitutional provision. Is this an example of conservatives avoiding applying originalism because of where it leads? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's one I hadn't thought about, so I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Watkins bringing that up. And so I would say a couple of things. So one is, I actually think there has been a robust debate, maybe, I don't know if continues is the right word, but has been a robust debate among original scholars about the Ninth Amendment. So I think the, 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 the most powerful intervention has been by Professor Randy Barnett, uh, who has been writing about the Ninth Amendment, oh my gosh, I want to say for 30 years now, for a long time. And, uh, and I remember as a, as a law student in your shoes, reading uh, Professor Barnett's, uh, he had some collections and some articles that he wrote. So, so he has staked out a position on that. And other original scholars have also staked out positions as well. So um, uh, Kurt Lash comes to mind as another person. So I think there is an ongoing debate. I, I, I don't have a, I guess what I was going to say is I tentatively don't think that there is a consensus on the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment. Um, well, I, I'm sorry, there's not a total consensus. I do think there are aspects of consensus among original scholars on that point. And, and, and I guess the second part of Mr. Watson's question is, is the lack of consensus a product of different policy views, and and maybe that's right. So I, I don't I don't I don't have definitive evidence that it's not. I don't I definitely don't have definitive evidence that it is. Uh, 
but in the way I think the way I would think about it would be, I would I would try to identify: Do I think that there is a clear original meaning to the to the to the Ninth Amendment? And if I come to that conclusion, right, that's my own judgment, and it could be wrong, but if that is my own judgment, then I then I would take the next step that Mr. Watkins is taking and, and say, what is the explanation for people coming to different conclusions? Now, if it's the case that the original meaning, although in your judgment determinate, is in other people's judge, judgments uh, uh, either uh, different, which might have the cor cor correlation of connotation of saying that the original meaning actually isn't fully determinate. And an example where I'm more familiar with that I think maybe parallels what Mr. Watkins is talking about is in the privileges or immunities clause. So it's another area where you could imagine policy preferences coming out differently. And what's happened in that area is there have been basically three different camps of original scholars, but with a lot of overlap as well. And so you've got uh, some scholars who, who I think all scholars or almost all scholars say that the privileges or immunities clause is a mechanism for incorporating the Bill of Rights against the states. And then I think there's Another group that says, uh, and there's also unenumerated protections, and then there's a question within that group about how do you find out what those unenumerated protections are? And so one explanation, this is the question for Mr. Watkins, is that, well, it's the different scholars' policy preferences that are leading to, that, to them to that conclusion. But when I read debates like the ones going on in the privileges or immunities clause context, Sophia, it, it seems to me like we have scholars who in good faith are grappling with the evidence, grappling with the conclusions, uh, and 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 so it's not that it's not that the politics are doing the work; it's that the scholars' different judgments are doing the work about what the evidence is showing them. And maybe that's, of course, influenced by one's world's view, but it, but it's it's not the same thing as saying that the politics is what's driving the difference. So, but that was a great question. Agreed. Um, can you explain the different types of originalism, first founding, second founding, and why that is important for understanding how and why originalism is not just a cover for conservatives? Yeah. Um, so in a previous episode, we talked about uh, some of the evolution of originalism. And you could describe the evolution maybe in kind of two and a half different stages. So stage number one was a relatively inchoate original intent to originalism with the idea that originalism was going to be good at binding the hands of judges. So that way executive, I'm sorry, that way elected officials would be able to exercise their policy preferences. Lots of criticisms of that, many of which I agree with. And then originalism 2.0 is original public meeting originalism, which tries to respond to some of those, those and other criticisms. And then I would say we're at a point now where, where we've got a variety of different originalisms that are a family of theories. So there's original intent, original public meaning, original understanding, original law, original methods. And then there's different sub-debates going on over things like star decisis, over things like the Ninth Amendment, over things like constitutional construction. And so how that relates to this, this topic tonight, Sophia, is that you, if one looks at the reasons that scholars gave for changing their views about what originalism was, what you see is scholars looking at the evidence and being persuaded that this, this version of originalism is not sound, but this other version of, of originalism is sound. And I'll give you two examples. So one is Professor Barnett, who we've mentioned earlier. Professor Barnett was one of the early advocates for original meaning and originalism. And he wrote an article that was initially a law review article, and then it was in his book, Restoring the Lost Constitution. And the article's title and the chapter's title is an, original, a, an originalism, I'm sorry, an, an originalism for non-originalists. And, and what he describes is the reasons that he found that persuaded him that originalism, although he was previously a living constitutionalist, that originalism is the correct theory of interpretation. And so what you see a person doing, maybe he's lying, but I have no reason to believe it. What you see him doing is a scholar engaging with reasons and arguments and then being persuaded by some of those arguments and then telling other people why he was persuaded. The second example I would use would be Jack Balkan. So Jack Balkan for a long time was a cogent critic of originalism. And then in a series of articles culminating in a book called Living Originalism, uh, Professor Balkan gave uh, his own explanation, as, and he characterized this as, as his own characterization, that he, he found that the arguments in favor of originalism were so powerful that, that he no longer could be a critic of originalism, but that he had to kind of become an originalist himself. Now, he has a, a, a different version of originalism than maybe some other originalists, but the basic idea of, of both fixation of the Constitution's text and constraint of that constitutional meaning on officers is a proposition to which Professor Balkan agrees. And so it's within the family of originalism. And again, his point was 
not that it was his politics that led him to do that, but it was the arguments in favor of originalism that led him to that position. Awesome. So we have a few more questions. Yeah. One is, what is the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, and can that even remotely go to being used to actually take a presidential candidate for the federal government off the ballot in numerous states? Okay. So that's a very important question. It's, it's a hot topic. One of the hats I wear, Sophia, is I am the director for the Institute of American Constitutional Thought and Leadership. And if, and if uh, Mr. Uh, let's see, Mr. Mesfin uh, goes to our website and you go to recent programs, you will see a debate between Professor Mark Graber, who I think is the leading scholar who, who argues that the 14th Amendment authorizes states to exclude candidates from the ballot, and also Professor Kurt Lash, who I think is either the A or, le a, a or the leading scholar for the opposite perspective, uh, making their respective arguments. So that's a very indirect way of saying that that's that's a an important issue. Uh, it's an issue about which scholars have been debating, and and actually I think there basically are like four sub issues on whether or not the Fourteenth Amendment allows a state to uh, exclude a candidate from the ballot. One of them being is the presidency one of the offices covered by Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment? And I've got kind of tentative views I would say on each of those different sub propositions, each of those, each of those four different sub propositions. But I haven't fully looked into it, and so I, it's kind of like the earlier question regarding um, um, uh, this the state, the ability of a state to defend itself. You know, I've got I've got some intuitions, I have some kind of generalized knowledge, but I don't have anything confident that I would I would say uh, in response to the question. And instead, what I would say would be to go read the scholarship by Professor Graber, go read the scholarship by Professor Lash, and I also think there was an important article by um, Michael Stokes Paulson and William Baud. That it, you can find it online. It's free, downloadable, and and I would read those different those different uh, pieces of scholarship, and then come to your own conclusion on that point. Yeah, that, it's a bit out of the scope of this discussion, but important question nonetheless. Yeah. There is another question earlier in the lecture. Campaign finance was mentioned as an example where originalists seem to act according to conservative policy preferences. How might these preferences reckon with Justin Rehnquist's dissent in First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti in 1978, where he questioned the scope of corporate speech when it extended beyond commercial speech? Alternatively, for the benefit of any non-lawyers in the audience, could you name some originalist case opinions or scholarship that yielded liberal policy outcomes? Yeah, so great questions. And uh, so the first part of the question by Mr. Potter is a little bit in the weeds. It's about... Um, I would, I would characterize it, maybe, I hope, I, hope it, I hope correctly, as do corporations have free speech rights under the First Amendment and or the 14th Amendment? And and that's, that's and there's there's a debate, so the case that I would point people to would be uh, the Citizens United case. Mm -hmm. And in that case, uh, the majority of, I'm sorry, the concurring opinion by Justice Scalia had a, had a debate with a dissenting opinion, I think by Justice Stevens, about whether the original meaning of the 14th Amendment included uh, protecting corporate speech. And, and so that, I think that's one place to see the debate on, on that particular issue. And, and what the question is asking is, um, Justice Rangos had a dissent where he questioned the scope of corporate speech. And then, and then I think the implication about the question is that later, the, the, the conservative or the originalist majority of the Supreme Court adopted um, a, a different perspective that, that would arguably more align with conservative policy preferences. And, and 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 so assuming that that story is correct, the one that I just gave, I think the question is whether or not the merits of the arguments by the majority or the dissent are more persuasive. And if one is persuaded by the dissent, then I think that supports the conclusion, although not definitively, because people make mistakes, but supports the conclusion that the outcome in Citizens United was not was not not was not uh, the work wasn't being done by originalism; it was being done by conservative policy preferences. And the second question. Could you name some originalist case opinions or scholarship that yielded liberal policy outcomes? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So kind of one way to test what we've been talking about is if it's the case that living constitutionalism always results in progressive outcomes, then, okay, it does seem like all the work's being done by policy preferences. And conversely, if you look at originalism and all the works, all the outcomes always seem to be conservative, then it seems like all the work is being done by policy preferences and not originalism. And one of the areas that I teach, so I, I teach a number of classes, it's actually really beneficial because you get to learn a lot of different areas. One of the areas I teach, Sophia, is criminal procedure. And if you, I don't know if you've had criminal procedure, but 
there are a lot of cases, especially more recent cases, where opinions authored by Justice Scalia and other, other originalist justices take uh, an approach that is clearly an originalist approach, but in a direction that is that one, I think, would fairly characterize as liberal under current policy preferences. So one case that I, that I love teaching is Florida versus Jardines. It's a 2012 case, and it deals with whether or not a search by Florida law enforcement officers, I'm sorry, whether or not an intrusion by Florida law enforcement officers was a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. And the court using an originalist methodology says yes. Um, there are some other areas where I think, so, that, so I think that's a clear example of what I'm saying. I think there's other kind of more nuanced examples that may not appear at first blush. So uh, for those who are law students, you might have covered the case NFIB versus Sebelius, which is com commonly characterized as a conservative opinion. But there's actually an aspect buried in there that I want to highlight that I think is, is, I think, clearly a liberal policy preference, but is one that's not questioned by any of the justices, and I think rightly so. And that is the original meaning of necessary in the Necessary and Proper Clause. So the original meaning of necessary as articulated by Chief Justice Chad Marshall in McCulloch versus Maryland was appropriate and plainly adapted. And, and I think the reason why we would, might characterize that as liberal is because it's very capacious. It gives the federal government lots of power. And that proposition, I think, is widely accepted in the original scholarship. And I think it's widely accepted by originalist justices as well. So even within an otherwise kind of opinion that one might characterize, I'm not agreeing with it, but might characterize as conservative, my point is that buried within it are premises and propositions that are clearly, or at least I think are clearly progressive by today's standards and are supported by originalism. And then the last thing I would say on that point in response to Mr. Potter's question is that there, if it's the case that originalism incorporates a doctrine of precedent, which is my view, the one that we talked about in a previous uh, episode, then it would also be the case that when originalist justices follow precedent and reach what would be, quote, liberal results, are also following originalism. And so an example that's commonly given is Texas versus Johnson. That's the opinion where the Supreme Court said the free speech clause protects the right to burn the American flag. I personally don't agree with that, uh, the ethics of that, but it's one where if one accepts the, that precedent is a source of legally binding information within originalism, and if one accepts that the precedent compelled the outcome in Texas versus Johnson, then the conclusion would be that Texas versus Johnson was warranted by originalism. And I think most people would agree that that's a, a more liberal result. So I just gave some examples that I think support and answer Mr. Potter's question. Awesome. We have another question that's also very on point. How can originalists reconcile the Constitution to apply to various groups that it did not originally apply to, such as African Americans and women? Hmm. That's, that's a great question. And, um, and and let me step back and, and rely on a, a point that I had made earlier. So what originals have done over the last, I guess now 25 years, is they've articulated a wide variety of justifications for originalism. Some of them are democracy. Some of them are the rule of law. Some of them are natural rights. My own is the common good of the American people and individual human flourishing. And so if, if, you, if you think about those reasons, and if you think those reasons are widely accepted to Americans of all sorts, or just humans more generally, then, then there's no reason in principle why Americans who are also African Americans and or women could not accept those reasons as reasons to support originalism. So, so my point is to emphasize that if, if originalism is supported by sound reasons, and, and those reasons are accept, accessible to all human beings, then it doesn't matter what our characteristics are. If we're persuaded by the reasons, then we should follow those reasons. And I'll just give you one maybe more detailed point on that. So my argument for originalism that I articulated in my book, Originalism's Promise, is that originalism is our legal system's key mechanism to provide for the conditions, what I call coordination, the coordination that Americans need to live together in relative peace. And there were three, three kind of key parts that I had addressed in there, but I'll just mention two because they're kind of easy to understand. One is that one is called justice, which everybody agrees that justice is sound. And number two is the rule of law. And so if my claim is right, which again, I'll just bracket for purposes of the sake of argument here. And if my claim is right, that originalism secures justice, distributive and commutative justice. And if my claim is right, that originalism advances the rule of law, neither of which perfectly, but on balance and overall significantly 
then those would be reasons that I think all Americans would want to embrace originalism, regardless of their different characteristics. So, so why why should why should why should different groups uh, follow originalism? Because it's supported by sound reasons. And if not, then don't follow it, right? And so you know, read read the scholarship. And if you're persuaded, then then great. And if not, then you should follow a different theory of interpretation. As a last question to follow that one up, uh, can you explain why originalism is an essential means of restraining the judiciary? Hmm. Okay. So I'll step back and, and describe where this idea came from, Sophia. So in Originalism 1.0, so back in the 1970s, the, 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 the key kind of uh, normative justification was we've got the Supreme Court going crazy all over the place, doing all these non-originalist interpretations. And if we just tied the judge's hands to the originally intended meaning, we would have very narrow space for judges to operate, so they'd be restrained. And we'd have very broad space for elected officials to be able to operate. And, and, that, and that would advance democracy. It would be really healthy in lots of different reasons. And I think it's the case that today, originalists typically don't rely on judicial restraint as a strong justification for originalism. And there's a couple of reasons for that. So one is that many scholars, including myself, think that the Constitution's original meaning isn't always determinate, isn't always restrained. So you could have original meaning that is vague, uh, ambiguous, open-textured. And so you, you would have judges who, judges or interpreters, I'll just say generally, who have discretion about how to construct constitutional meaning. And so you end up not having restrained judges. And also, if you think about it, uh, if you've had constitutional law structure, you cover the Commerce Clause, the original meaning of the Commerce Clause would actually be relatively narrower than the current meaning, the non-originalist meaning articulated in cases like Wicked versus Filburn. And if judges were to enforce the, the, the original meaning, they would actually be striking down more acts of the elective branches than they currently do. And that doesn't really seem restrained either. And so, so, so current originalism doesn't, doesn't necessarily view originalism as being restrained in the sense that it was back in the 1970s. And so what originals have argued is that these other normative justifications like democracy and natural rights and natural law are the reasons for originalism. And restraint is, is it just an instrumental tool to help originalist judges and, and elected officials get to the end state of affairs of advancing democracy and the rule of law and, and other benefits. So, so restraint is, is still a value, but it's not the ultimate value anymore. It's, it's something more narrow. Thank you so much. Um, we have gone past our allotted time, but this has been a really great discussion. I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has as well. Um, thank you all for coming and thanks for such good questions. Thank you, Professor String. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. It was great to meet you and really great questions tonight. Yes, agreed. Thank you. Everyone have a good night. Thank you.